What is up, everybody? Welcome to the first lesson for long distance learning. Um, hope you're all excited about it. Hope you're all doing well. Um, so I'm going to basically run you through what I'm going to be using here, and then we'll get into our first lesson. And then I will go through a couple of tabs that I have up at the top here. Uh, this is called Screencastify. Uh, hope it works out for everybody. Make sure that you uh, follow along and you can pause and you can rewatch and you can take notes at your own pace. So feel free to do that. Uh, I'm not putting my face on these uh, video casts, so I hope that doesn't bother anybody. That's just me talking. Um, but so basically what we're going to do is we're going to go through the Versal lessons just like we would normally do. And as you see over here, we have, you know, four different sections and each one of the lessons per day. So today's lesson will be on DNA structure, and then the next lesson will be on replication, then synthesis, and then mutations. You will have assignments for each uh, section. So you'll have a DNA structure assignment, then another assignment for replication, synthesis, mutations. And the assignment is up here, uh, which I will show you um, later on. We'll go through that together. Um, but I am going to be switching through things. I'm going to be um, toggling around. Uh, just bear with me while I uh, get through this. Okay, it's the first time I'm using it, so I'm kind of new to it as well. Um, but we are going to be talking about DNA. Okay, and uh, the first lesson is going to be on the structure and some history of DNA about the some of the people, important people in, involved in um, discovering DNA and the structure and the uses of DNA. So, so far, what have we learned, right? We have learned... Um, about Mendel. Okay, let me just grab a pen down here. We learned about Mendel, right? And we learned about um, heredity and alleles. And that's really important because Mendel didn't know anything about DNA. Mendel lived in a time where DNA was not known yet. DNA has only been around, like we've only known about the structure of DNA since uh, 1953. Okay. Um, and actually 1955, I want to say. 55. That's when DNA was first revealed as the uh, genetic informational molecule that's in our um, cells, right? So Mendel had no idea what DNA was at the time. He was just looking at observations on what he saw with his pea plants and his other uh, things that he uh, experimented on, and he came up with his laws. Okay, through the 1940s and maybe late 30s, 40s, and 50s, we learned a lot about um, DNA. And we're going to go through that stuff today. So let's just talk about what it means, right? D oxy, D oxy, oxy, ribo. Okay, that's the first letter in DNA, deoxy ribo. What does that mean? Okay, the, the term DE means to remove. So if you defrost something or you de-ice something, you're removing the frost, you're removing the ice from that particular thing. So we're de-something, we're removing something. What are we removing? We're removing oxygen, okay? So we're removing oxygen. That's what the oxy stands for is oxygen. So we're gonna remove oxygen. What are we removing oxygen from? We're removing it from a ribose. And anything that ends in O-S-E is a sugar, okay? So like, ribose, dextrose, maltose, lactose, um, glucose, any of those oses are going to be considered to be sugars. So um, deoxyribo stands for a ribo sugar, and ribo sugar is a five carbon sugar, and it looks like a pentagon. And that pentagon is going to have an oxygen removed from it. So if I open up a new page here and I show you DNA structure versus RNA structure because RNA is ribonucleic acid. So you can see the difference between the two structures. Let's see if I can find it here. DNA structure versus RNA structure. Here we go. So this is a good example of it. <clears throat> So what we see in this picture here, if I can kind of just zoom in on it, okay? Over here, we have DNA, and over here we have RNA. So this is, whoop, whoop, what did I just do there? Okay, whoops, like I said, deal with me. 
I'm working. I'm working. Okay, let's see. Let's see if I can find it one more time. Here it is. Okay, let's shrink this down. Okay, let's go over here. Let's open this up in a new tab so I don't keep messing it up. There it is. Okay. So what we have over here, this is RNA, which is ribonucleic acid. And this is DNA, which is deoxyribonucleic acid. Or this is a ribose, right? It's a five, uh, it's a five carbon sugar. There's every corner that you don't see a C in, that's a different carbon. So that's carbon one, two, three, four, and here's the fifth one. Okay, so that's a five carbon sugar. Okay, and this is DNA and this is RNA. RNA is the same thing. Okay, it's ribose. Okay, this is a ribose sugar and this is a ribose sugar, but this ribose is deoxified. And you can see that over here. We're missing an O here, right? So there's an O here and there's an O here. All right, so ribonucleic acid, which is just a regular ribose, has two O's on uh, coming off the bottom of it. And over here, deoxyribose is one less O. We're missing an O on this hydrogen. We're missing an oxygen there. So we've deoxyed this ribose sugar. Okay, so I'm just going to close that tab out so that you understand what that means, right? So we are taking or removing an oxygen from a ribose sugar, which is a five carbon. That's what deoxyribose, that's what the D stands for in DNA, deoxyribo. Okay. The N stands for nucleic acid. Okay. D N A. Okay. Deoxyribo nucleic acid. Now the nucleic acids we learned uh, back in the macromolecule chapter, that they come in four different types, and those are called A, T, G, and C. Whoops. Strike that. Reverse it. Okay, A, T, G, and C. What those stand for are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine thymine okay so those are my four nucleic acids that we find in dna okay so we're just gonna wipe this screen clear we're gonna go back here and then we're gonna go back to the versal okay so what we see on the versal lesson here let me kind of move this down there we go. Scroll down. We see this picture here, okay? And we see some words that we need to know. Let me just minimize this a tad so we have a little bit more room, okay? So we can see more of the words. There we go. Okay, so what we see here, we want to get into the structure of DNA today. That's one of the goals that we want to do today. And what we want to look at is what, what or what you're looking at here, this is called a nucleotide, Okay. And a nucleotide is the building blocks for DNA. So we build DNA up with these things called nucleotides. And DNA, uh, just to go back to over here, DNA is the uh, genetic code, right? What DNA is, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, it's a genetic code. And what is that genetic code? for what's it used for it's used to make proteins okay and these proteins are going to give you traits they're going to be responsible for traits and all these traits are the things that we saw in the hereditary chapter right we'd like eye color hair color the way you metabolize foods um textures of things all, all different types of traits we looked at all different things color blindness so on and so forth right and your dna is made of the same exact things that the DNA of any organism is made of. Um, we have things like bacteria, which are prokaryotic cells, right? Bacteria. And they have DNA. They have one chromosome of DNA. And then you have eukaryotic bacteria, if you remember that. Uh, eukaryotic cells, not eukaryotic bacteria. Eukaryotic cells like humans and fungus and protists and animals and plants and all those different things. 
and our DNA is held inside of a nucleus. Okay, and we have multiple chromosomes. We have uh, way, way more than one chromosome. Okay, organisms can vary. Humans have 46 chromosomes, where um, other organisms, uh, we can take a look at one if we like. We can say uh, chromosome number, chromosome number in uh, dogs. Okay, and dogs have 78 chromosomes. See right there, dogs have 78 chromosomes. So um, the number of chromosomes is going to be what makes you different from anything else in the world, right? So all organisms are made of the same four letters, A, T, G, and C. Um, so that's not what makes us different. The, the actual components of our DNA is not what makes us different. What makes us different is the order in which these letters come in, and we'll see that, and the amount of the letters that we have, right? So we have 46 chromosomes worth of letters. Dogs have 78 chromosomes worth of letters. Bacteria have one chromosome worth of letters. And the amount of letters does not dictate how uh, complex you are, right? We, we are, uh, you know, by all intents and purposes, are more um, uh, complex than a dog, but dogs have way more chromosomes than we do. So and that has nothing. And there are, there are flowers that have hundreds of chromosomes. So the number of chromosomes does not make you more or less uh, complex, but what it does do is it gives you different traits, right? So our, our combination of, of A's, T's, G's, and C's with the amount of our A's, T's, G's, and C's gives us certain proteins that give us certain traits that other organisms don't have, right? So let's go back and take a look at this picture. So this picture here, is a segment of DNA. And I want to take a look at this segment of DNA and the parts um, of the DNA that uh, we see here. So you guys all probably know um, the typical picture of DNA, which kind of looks like, you know, this, right? It kind of looks like a one of these things, right? And you all seen this twisted ladder type of structure, okay? Um, if I were to take this uh, twisted ladder, uh, which is called a double helix, and we'll get into the double helix part of it later, um, but if we took it and we straightened it out, and what we would see is something more like a traditional ladder, a non-twisted ladder. And what this picture here is, is the molecular picture of this simple ladder picture, okay? So, like I said before, these are called nucleotides, right? And one of these is a nucleotide. So this here is one nucleotide. This is another nucleotide. Here's another one. So there are four nucleotides present in this particular picture, right? So if I just change my color of my th thing here, this would be one nucleotide, okay? What I circled here and what I circled here would be the same thing. So if I was to just separate that. That is a nucleotide. That's this. Okay. This and this are the same. Okay. So how is that possible? So let's take a look at what that is. So a nucleotide has three major um, portions. And these are the three major portions of a nucleotide. Okay. So let me just get rid of this circle real quick. Okay. And back to the red. So the first thing um, on our list is what we call a phosphate group. And a phosphate group are these little blue spheres here. And these little phosphates are nothing more than a phosphorus molecule that is going to be used. The function of this is to hold our nucleotides together, right? So this nucleotide is held to this nucleotide with the bond between the phosphate and this phosphate is going to hold this nucleotide to that nucleotide, and this nucleotide to that nucleotide, and this nucleotide to that nucleotide. So this piece of ladder is connected to the piece above it by a phosphate, and that's connected to the piece above that by another phosphate, which is connected to, uh, and so on and so forth. We're only looking at half of this ladder, right? If I took this ladder and split it in half, we're only looking at one side of the ladder here, okay? We would have this whole structure, again, on top going like this, OK? 
okay, to, the, to that bottom. And we'll get back to that in a minute, okay? So this phosphate is going to be the kind of like the mortar that's in between bricks, right? So if you looked at a house uh, and all the different bricks on the house are, you know, cemented together. So this brick is cemented to this brick with the bonds between the phosphate group and the next uh, nucleotide, if that makes any sense. Okay. So that's what the phosphate group does. The number two portion of R, and there's no, there's no number system really here. These, there's no real one or two or anything. I'm just going in what I see. The next thing that we're going to talk about is the deoxyribose. Okay. So the deoxyribose is this pentagon shape. That's what I showed you before when we talked about deoxyribose versus regular ribose sugars. Okay. So this deoxyribose, this little pentagon shape is a sugar. And each one of these sugars is going to attach on one end to a phosphate, which connects it to the next nucleotide. So here, this one nucleotide has a phosphate and a ribose sugar. Okay, the last thing that is on my nucleotide is going to be a nucleic acid or a nitrogenous base. That's why they call it a base. So we can call these nucleic acids, or we can call them nitrogenous bases. Okay, so there are four different nucleic acids that can be attached to the deoxyribose. It can either be A, G, C, or T. Okay, now in your DNA, you can have all the same letters. You can have a whole different mixture of these letters, but all the letters must be one of these four, A's, G's, C's, or T's. Okay, so what we're seeing in one nucleotide here, okay, this one nucleotide is attached to this nucleotide, which is attached to this one, which is attached to this one. Okay, and that's what we see here. So if we go back to this picture, okay, this could be an A, this could be a T, this could be a C, this could be a G, and over here is my ribose, and over here is my phosphate, and here's another ribose, and here's another phosphate, and here's another ribose, and here's another phosphate, and this nucleotide is held to the one above it or below it with the bonds between this phosphate and this sugar, this phosphate, that sugar this phosphate, that sugar, so on and so forth, okay? And that's a nucleotide. Those are the building blocks for DNA. So let me just wipe this clean, and then we're going to move down our versal lesson, okay? So let's talk about some of the people that are really important in finding out some of the structure, right? So as of now, we know very little about DNA um, so far, right? So we, we know that DNA is responsible for making proteins, and those proteins are responsible for giving you traits. We know that they are made of things called nucleotides, and that these nucleotides um, are made of three portions, a phosphate group, a deoxyribose, and a base pair, okay, or a, or a nitrogenous base. So if we go to <clears throat> back to the whiteboard here. We're going to talk about somebody called Shargoff. Okay, and we're going to clear this page out. Okay. And these nucleic acids, okay, these nucleic acids. These nucleic acids, these A's, T's, G's, and C's. Okay. These are the informational portion of our DNA. These are the genetic, this is the code, okay? That's the code. The phosphate and the ribose, that's not the genetic portion. That's the structural portion. Okay, so if I go back to this picture on the versal, Okay, this is structural. That is there to hold together the informational portion. Okay, so if I go back to my ladder here. Okay, I change the color of my thing. This is structural, and that is that. Okay, on both sides, right? So this is one set of phosphorus and riboses. This is another set of phosphorus and riboses because we have two of them that point in towards each other, okay? And those are structural. 
So every organism on the planet, no matter if it's a fungus or a protist or a bacteria or an animal or a plant, all of them have this. The thing that makes everything different from one another is these letters. How many of these letters do you have? And what is the order of these letters? Okay, that's what's really important. Now, DNA, we call DNA a double helix. Okay, DNA is a double helix. Ooh, I changed colors there. Helix. So what we saw, this is one of the helices. Okay. And this is going to be my phosphates. And this is going to be my riboses. And these are going to be my nucleic acids, right? So these are my nucleotides. Okay. So here's one nucleotide, two, three, four, right? Phosphate, ribose, fibose, ribose, phosphate, ribose, and then our nucleic acids. That's one helix, right? And that spins around. Okay. DNA is a double helix. So on the opposite side, which is the other side of the ladder, is going to be our second helix. And that second helix is going to have a phosphorus and a ribose, ribose a phosphorus and a ribose, phosphorus, ribose, and they're going to be attached to other nucleic acids. But what we want to learn about now is that there are rules that go along with this. Okay, And the rule that we want to learn is called Shargoff's rule. Shargoff's rule, and that you can see on my Versal lesson, Shargoff's rules, okay? What Shargoff found out was that every time he looked at DNA, and again, he doesn't know what DNA is at this point. He knows it's important. He knows it's held in a nucleus. He knows that um, if you take the nucleus away from a cell, that the cell doesn't function properly. If you mess around with the nucleus of a cell, the cell does not function right anymore, right? So that, that's what they know at this point, okay? And they also know that there are things called nucleic acids. They do know that A's, T's, G's, and C's are present. They don't know what they're used for. They don't know why they're there, but they know that they are present, okay? What Shargoff finds out is that no matter what organism he looks at, no matter what the amount of DNA that that organism has. That organism can have one chromosome. That organism can have 46 chromosomes. That organism can have 200 chromosomes. It doesn't matter. In every single organism that he looks at, the percentage of adenine in the cell of that organism was always equal to the percentage of T in that organism. So whatever amount of adenine that organism had was always equal to the amount of adenine that organism had. Same thing goes for the G's and the C's. Every time he saw a certain percentage of G, it always equaled the certain percentage of C. And this made him wonder, why is it all the time A percentages equal the T percentages? And why is it always that G percentages always equal the C percentages? And what he came up with was that there must be some type of interaction between A and T chemically, like a bond. All right, there must be some bonding there because every time you see A or the percentage of A equals the percentage of T. So that means every time you see an A, there must be a T with it and so on and so forth. Every time you see a T, there's an A with it. Every time you see a G, there's a C with it. Every time you see a C, there's a G with it, right? So he concluded that there must be some type of chemical interaction between A's and T's and G's and C's, okay? And that's what we see from him. Okay, um, so if I gave you a question, okay, go back to my whiteboard. If I gave you a question that said, okay, uh, we looked at an organism, and that organism has an adenine percentage of 18%. The percentage of A in an organism is 18%. It doesn't matter what the organism is. It could be a bacteria, a flower, a pea plant, a human, doesn't matter. The amount of A in the total genome and the total amount of DNA that this organism has, 18% of it is A. What would you guys do to figure out how much T, G, and C that, that organism has? I'll give you a second to figure it out. Okay, so... What you want to do is that you know that A equals T, right? So if A is 18, then T must be 18. We know that for sure. 
Now we have to figure out what G and C is, and you can. You don't need to have any other information except one of these letters. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to say that, you know, A's, T's, G's, and C's, all of this equals 100, right? And we are going to subtract the amount of A and the amount of T. So 18 plus 18 equals 36. And we're just going to subtract 36 from 100, which leaves me with 64. We know that 64 has to be made up of G and C combined. And we know that the amount of G is always equal to the amount of C. So if we divide this by 2, we come up with our answer of each one of them is 32%, right? So G is 32% and C is 32%. If you add up 32, 32, 18, and 18, that should give you 100% of the DNA for that particular organism. So look for that kind of question on a test in the future or a quiz in the future, okay? And that all came from Shargoff's rule, okay? So now, the next people we want to look at is we want to look at probably the most famous people that have to do with DNA, and that's going to be Mr. Watson and Crick, okay? And Watson and Crick are probably the most famous um, DNA scientists to ever live. Um, if you study science uh, going forward in college or anything, these two men will be the, the names that you really, really remember. They won the Nobel Prize for discovering the, uh, the shape of DNA. Okay, they discovered the shape of DNA. They did not discover DNA. Um, DNA was already, has, has had already been spoken about for a couple of years at this point. So this was 1953. So I was right at the beginning, 1953. Um, there were other people like Shargoff. Um, there was a woman named uh, Rosalind Franklin, Rosalind Franklin, and she was pivotal in the discovery uh, that these men made, right? So that's what science is, and that's one thing that we always wanted to impress upon you guys is that science is always learning from other science, right? So these two gentlemen, uh, one of which is a physicist, one is a mathematician, or one is a chemist and one's a mathematician, uh, they learned a lot and from Shargoff, from Rosalind Franklin, and they used the information from Shargoff and Rosalind Franklin to find out that DNA is, in fact, a double helix. And the way that they did this was pretty rudimentary, to be honest with you. And what they did was they pretty much took the shapes of the nitrogenous bases, the A's, T's, G's, and C's, and they cut them out into cardboard, and they made these shapes. So let me so let me go up here and get you the shapes of the nucleic acids. Let me do that real quick. Okay. So nucleic acid shapes. Did I spell that wrong? That's okay. Google knows what I'm talking about. Nucleic acid shape. So if we take a look at the nucleic acids, we can see that they have different shapes. Okay, we can see that the A's, oh boy, that's not what I want. Let's do this one. Okay. Okay, we can see that A has a particular shape that's kind of similar to G. A and G are very similar in shape, and C and T are similar in shape, okay? So what they did was they actually made these shapes. They knew the shapes of these. How they knew the shapes of these in 1953, I do not know, okay? Just take my word for it. What they did, Watson and Crick, was they took these shapes, since they knew what the shapes were, and they cut them out into cardboard pieces. They actually made cardboard models of these particular shapes, and what they did was they would lay them on top of one another and they would hold them next to each other. They knew because of Shargoff that A has to bond to T. And they knew because of Shargoff that G had to bond to C. But no one could come up with the idea of how they fit together. Because if you take those molecules and you stick them together, A 
to T and G to C, they don't really um, go together all that well, right? So if I have an A and a T and they bond together and I try to put a G and a C over them, just make believe it's it's growing towards you at this point, right? If I try to put a G and a C above it, like a ladder is growing upwards to the sky, it, they found out that it didn't fit. It, for some reason, it just did not fit together. And you couldn't just stack them on top of one another. What they found out was that in order for DNA to work properly, that the bonds between these um, nucleotides had to be twisted, right? So this nucleotide was in this model. And then the one above it has to be slightly tilted above it. And the one above that has to be slightly tilted even further to, in order to fit above that. And the one above that has to be tilted even more. And the one above that, even more. And the one above that, even more. So now we're looking at this from an overhead view. If you look at this from a side angle, what you're going to see is a spiral staircase. What you're going to see eventually is this. You're going to see this shape. And because, let me go back to my pen here, you can see that each one of these is twisted a little bit. It's turn, 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 turn. And we see that it's twisting this way, and then this way, and then this way, and then this way, okay? And what I was drawing for you was if you were looking at a bird's eye view of this, if you were looking down at, from, from a, a top it, looking down at like, like through a straw almost, what you would see are these lines crossing each other in patterns, okay? And they're the ones that found out that you can't just stack them up on top of one another like this. Okay, it's not going to work. It needs to have a twist. And that's why they're so famous. And that's why they are so important to DNA biology, because they were the ones that found out that in order for all of these things, in order for these A's, T's, G's, and C's to stick together and combine properly, that they had to twist around one another as they increased in size. Okay, and they won a Nobel Prize for this. And I think Shargoff might have won a Nobel Prize for this as well. Um, Rosalind Franklin did not, sadly. And the reason she did not win a Nobel Prize is because um, in order to win a Nobel Prize, you must be alive to accept the award. And she died a couple of months prior to the award being given out. So because she um, passed away, prior to the, the giving out of the award, she was not eligible to get the award, which really stinks. Um, and a lot of times she's forgotten uh, in the whole um, discovery of DNA, but I want you guys to know about her and who she is, okay? So let's take a look at this uh, diagram. This is going to be um, one of the last things that we talk about today, all right? So what we see here is the structure of DNA. So now we see two sides, right? So here is one nucleotide, correct? Here's another nucleotide. Okay, so you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. You got twelve nucleotides here. Okay, you got six on one side, you got six on the other side that gives you twelve overall total nucleotides. We see that this is the double helix wrapped around one another like a coiled spring or two coiled springs. That's why it's a double helix, right? Because one of these is a helix and the other ribbon, it's almost like two ribbons wrapped around each other, right? One ribbon is one is forming one helix. The other ribbon is the forming the other helix and they both wrap around each other. That's why it's called a double helix. If we straightened it out into a, into a straight ladder, that's what we see here, right? So this is, one side of the ladder, this is the other side of the ladder, and the things in the middle are the rungs, right? That is my ladder. And what do we see here? Here's the structural components, right? Just to recap, here are my structural components. These are my 
sugars. That's why it's an S, my ribose sugars, okay, which is attached to a phosphate and a nucleic acid or the base, the nitrogenous base. Okay, that's what we see here. And that's connected to the next nucleotide, which is connected to the next nucleotide, to the next nucleotide, to the next nucleotide. And they, this helix, is attached to this helix on this side, okay, in the middle with the bases, okay? The A's, T's, G's, and C's are all connected to one another in the center. So some things that we want to look at. We want to know the phosphate groups, right? Those are the, these structural components here. We want to know the five carbon ribose sugar, which are these pentagons. And we see that some are facing in one direction, some facing the other. And we're going to get into that in a, in a later um, lesson, actually the next one, next lesson, okay? Here are our nitrogen bases or our nucleic acids, A's, T's, G's, and C's. But we want to know two other things. We want to know that we see some solid lines. Okay, here's a solid line. Okay, here's a solid line. All these solid lines. And then we see dot dash lines. And the solid lines and the dash lines represent different things. Okay, so we want to be able to distinguish what those mean. Okay, the solid lines are going to be covalent bonds. Okay, solid lines, covalent. Okay, so this phosphorus is connected to this sugar with a covalent bond. We know that because it's a solid line right there. This sugar is connected to this nucleic acid with a solid line, so we know it's a covalent bond. Okay, does that make sense? Covalent bonds are very strong, strong bonds, okay? We want the structure of DNA to be very strong. We do not want DNA to break apart. We do not want DNA to um, be misshapen. So we want the structural components to be very strong. So all of these solid lines are covalent bonds, which are nice, strong, shared electrons, right? We remember our uh, chemistry chapter. We see in the middle, between the base pairs, between the A's, T's, G's, and C's, that we see dotted lines. And those dotted lines represent hydrogen bonds, okay? And a hydrogen bond is a weak bond. Mr. I, why are there weak bonds in DNA? I thought you said we want it to be strong. We don't want it to break. And for the most part, that is true. But you're going to hear me talking about DNA as a cookbook. And the recipes inside of this cookbook are recipes for proteins. So it's a cookbook for proteins. And if you wanted to, if you had a cookbook and you wanted to make chocolate chip cookies, and inside that cookbook was the recipe for chocolate chip cookies. Because that's what this is, right? This is a cookbook. This entire thing is a cookbook, right? Because we have, you know, 46 chromosomes, which make up our cookbook. That, that entirety of our chromosomes is our cookbook. And portions of, of those 46 chromosomes are responsible for traits. Some of that 46 chromosomes is responsible for our eyes. Some of those chromosomes or some portions of those chromosomes are responsible for our uh, color blindness or not color blindness. It's responsible for our widow's peak versus non widow's peak. Our skin color, our eye color, our you know ability to metabolize things. All those different portions of those uh, chromosomes, which we call genes, right? Genes are portions of DNA that are responsible for traits. Each one of those is a recipe for a protein, right? Now, in order to make your cookies, if you wanted to make your chocolate chip cookies, you would have to open up the cookbook right? If you don't open up the cookbook, you'll never see what the recipe tells you to do. If you, if you just have the book closed in front of you, you'll never know how much sugar to add, how many chocolate chips to add, how much butter to add to your chocolate chip cookies. The same thing goes to your DNA. If you never open up the cookbook, you'll never know what the recipe is for the protein, so you'll never make the correct protein, right? If, you, if I just gave you a cookbook and told you not to look in it but make chocolate chip cookies, um, you're probably not going to make the cookie that you want to make unless you are a proficient baker. But let's just assume you're not. And the same thing goes for, for this. If you never open the cookbook, you'll never know how to make the protein and therefore the protein will come out wrong. And when you have a protein that comes out wrong, that typically ends up as a disease. Okay. That could be any type of diseases, right? If that um, protein comes out wrong. Okay. So these hydrogen bonds, are there to act as weak bonds so that so that your cell can go in and read the recipe, right? This sequence of letters is a sequence 
for a protein. And these specific letters in a specific sequence give you a certain protein. And if you read them wrong, you get the disease or you get a mutation is what we call it, right? So there is something, and we're going to look at that when we look at re replication and things like that. We're going to see that this DNA has to open, okay? It has to open up like a book would open up so that different chemicals in the body can read the letters, okay? And if we didn't open them up, then we would never be able to read them. Okay, so we want these bonds to be fairly weak so that we can take apart the DNA so that we can read it, but we definitely want it to go back very, very easily. Okay, so these hydrogen bonds are kind of like little magnetic forces, right? This A is magnetically attracted to this T and this G is magnetically attracted to this C. Okay, so we, we want to, you can pull a magnet apart fairly easily and you can also put it back together fairly easily. And that's what these um, hydrogen bonds are going to do. Okay, so we did uh, a bunch of stuff. We talked about, go back to the top, we talked about what DNA is, what it, what it stands for, what it does, its function overall is the, it's the um, cookbook or the, the genetic code for proteins. We looked at the building blocks, which were our uh, nucleotides, which have three portions, a phosphate group or deoxyribose and a base pair or a base, which is an A, T, G, or C. Okay. We looked at Chargaff's rules, which tell us the base pairing procedure, right? So when this A base pairs with this T, that's called a base pair. And we learned that from Chargaff that A always base pairs with T and G always base pairs with C because every time that he saw a certain amount of A in an organism, it always equaled to the amount of T in that organism. And we could figure that out. We I gave you a a problem on how to figure that out, okay? And we looked at the structural components, and we looked at the genetic components, the center here, these base pairs, the amount of uh, letters that you have, and the order in which these letters come is what makes you different from every other organism, right? The, the, the sheer amount of, of letters makes us different than a dog, but the order of letters makes us different from each other, right? Because we are all of the same species, right? Humans are all uh, 46 chromosome um, of the same species, but what makes you different from your family members and your brothers and sisters and, and classmates is not the number of chromosomes. You all have 46, but what makes you different is the order in which these letters come, right? So my order is going to be slightly different than your order. Actually, it's going to be like 0.1% different. Okay. All human beings are like 99.9% .9 the same. Okay. There's a 0.1% difference. And when you have 300 million letters, Okay, 0.1% uh, actually makes a, a pretty big difference, okay? So that is going to uh, pretty much end this section of the lesson, right? So we want to know all about Shargoff. We want to know about what's in Crick, what they did. We want to know about the, the different um, structures. Okay, we, we talked about hydrogen bonds and covalent bonds and base pairing. Okay, you can read through all of this. At the bottom of this Versa lesson is a video. Um, if you wanted to watch the video, here is the title of it. Okay, um, you can watch it on YouTube. I'm not going to show it here because it's a 17-minute video on the discovery of the double helix. So it's a little movie about Watson and Crick. It's very good. So you can check that out. There's the title if you want to just type that into YouTube itself. Um, this is also another, uh, you know, uh, this is Bozeman. He's really good. He's an AP uh, science teacher. He's basically going to tell you the same thing that I told you. So you can watch that or, or not. And then at the end, if it loads up, you have, here it is, okay, you have a, um, a way to study, okay? So if this is a Quizlet, okay? I, I hope you do this, and you can choose different modes to study from. You can choose um, flashcards, uh, tests, matching columns, all different types of things. So I encourage you to do that. So let's talk about what your assignment is and how we are going to run this um, basically for the remainder of this course, okay? So um, on the classroom, this is not this this will be posted um, when you guys see this video. But um, while I'm making this video, this is not posted yet. So let's just talk through it. So it says you are to watch. So you have a couple of things to do. Number one, you are to watch this video. OK, which you obviously are if you are listening to me. OK, then you have some things that you have to hand in. OK, these are the things that need to be handed in. And I'm going to basically copy and paste the same, um, you know, 
set up every time and just change certain parts in it. So make sure you read it. It's going to look the same, but um, make sure you read it. So number one, you're going to complete a worksheet that I have attached and you're going to upload it as an assignment. This is an assignment. So you're going to upload that worksheet to the assignment. You can do it in one of two ways. You can either do it through Doc Hub like we normally do in class where you open it up in Doc Hub and you can edit it right on the PDF. Or if you want, you can print out the sheets um, from the from the document and uh, you can write the hand, write the answers and then take pictures with your phone um, of the homework pages and then upload them as an attachment uh, to this assignment. OK, make sure I can read the answers because I have to grade this stuff. OK, so make sure I can read the answers either on the doc hub or on the pictures. OK, make sure the pictures are nice and close so I can read them. Those are the only two methods I will accept. OK, so Jim, please do not email me and ask if you can rewrite the questions. OK, do not do that. Either use doc hub or print them out, handwrite, and then take pictures and upload the pictures. And that's one thing you have to hand in. Another thing you have to hand in is we're going to continue to do our essays. OK, uh, just like we did during the year, we're going to continue to do our essays, but it's going to be a little bit different this time because I'm going to require you to do the essay for this lesson and then upload just this lesson's essay. OK, so tonight you have a worksheet due and then you have the summary for this lesson due uh, as well. OK, now the next topic is going to be go back to this next topic is going to be DNA replication. Right. And then the next assignment will look very much like this. There'll be a worksheet for replication and there'll be an essay for replication. I'm going to I'm going to require you guys to upload each section. Normally, as you guys know, in my class, I would have you do a summary at the end of each class. And then at the end, I would collect the entire essay as one document. I'm not going to do that here. I can't do that here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to you're going to upload each segment. So you're going to upload one essay, which should, should be short. It should be, you know, five to eight to ten sentences. So you're going to have one summary on DNA structure, which you'll hand in on lesson one, one essay on DNA replication, which would be lesson two, one on protein synthesis, one on genetic mutations. Each one of them may be five to eight to ten sentences each, and then you will upload them each individually. And then at the end, we will have a a, uh, we'll have Kia quizzes, and I will let you know when you have those Kia quizzes. And you will also have um, a test on Kia as well. So there will be a quiz on DNA structure, which will be, um, you will have to take it by 11 p.m. on the 23rd, right? So this assignment is... Uh, was posted on the 19th or when now that you're hearing this it's the 19th um, the quiz for this particular video will be the next class and you'll have to take that by 11 p.m. okay so I'm gonna set it on Kia that you have to take it by 11 p.m. if you try to take it after 11 p.m. it will not let you take it and if you don't take it it's gonna be a zero okay so please don't let that happen okay if I scroll down a little bit more you can see here is the PDF of the uh, assignment Okay, and that is really it. Okay, um, what else did I do? This is the actual assignment. So here is the worksheet, and we will go over this during the next um, class. Okay, so make sure you've put all this in. Okay, these will be what your grades will be coming from now, from now on. Okay, so make sure you do that. And I also, okay, I'm just going to save this as a draft. I also uploaded. <clears throat> the textbook, okay, not that you'll really need it, but I uploaded the chapter 12 of the textbook, which is chapter 12, and here's the link for the versal, as I always do. And this is these two things are going to cover lessons one through five, um, which is the first four lessons will be one, two, three, four, and the fifth lesson will be the day of the test. All right, so hopefully this was uh, productive for you. Um, I'm not going to explain all this stuff over and over and over again. It's just going to be this one time. Um, and don't forget that if you have any questions, every Monday and Thursday between 1230 and 1.15, hit that Google Meet link if you have any questions and you can ask me the questions. Okay, when you do not delete that invitation I gave you because that will be the same link every single time that we want to have a Google meeting on those Mondays and Thursdays between 1230 and 1.15. All right, when you enter the, the chat room, 
have your microphone on mute and um, I will call on you individually. I will unmute you to so that you can ask your questions. All right. Thanks for listening, guys. Uh, have a good one. And I'll see you on uh, the community period time.